The Lao Street ends Friday at a one-month low and ends lower for the second day in a row. Could the Nifty below 20-day moving average spell trouble for the bulls? And at current valuations, what kind of returns can we expect from the Nifty in 2023? And is the PSC index on the verge of a multi-decadal breakout? We discuss all that and much more in this week's edition of Editor's Roundtable. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me is Prashant, Anuj, Nimesh and Nigel. Hi, guys. We're yeah, actually a full team today. <laughs> full team. <laughs> yeah. I missed out the last, missed uh, couple, out the of, last couple of, uh, of things, yeah. couple of episodes, but good to be back. And uh, uh, the market's not looking good, of course. No uh, Santa Claus rally. Uh, yeah, and especially the last couple of days, I think, were brutal. Friday yeah. was brutal. I think Thursday, the market preempted a lot of Friday decline. Uh, but Friday, the market attempted two rallies, both were sold into. I think the message is loud, loud and clear. And uh, even in the US, I think the market got a bit cocky about what uh, Jeremy Powell was about to say and how the market reacted to that. And next day, I think it had a bit of a reality check. Okay, so before we get chatting about the markets, quickly, the prediction for the FIFA World Cup. I thought final. we were uh, keeping it for the end, but. Uh, <laughs> Argentina. I have said France 5 1. <laughs> Five one. France 5-1. France 5-1. I have said France 5-1. You know, when you make a prediction, make it as outlandish as it can be. <laughs> and bold. What, what, Argentina. What you? Argentina. Argentina. I think France. I mean, I, w I would want... So, we are uh, two all now. Nigel, yeah. you are the... Argentina. No, based on form, it has to be France, so I'm going with France. No, no, no. But okay. heart is with Argentina, Argentina, so I'm going with France. Okay. So, 3-2 basically. Let's see. But in the heart, for most people would be with Argentina. Argentina. Right? Argentina. I mean, uh, great South American football. Uh, so, we'll see. Uh, Anuj, been. But the market is not looking all that great, right? No, it's 20 not. 20-day moving average we've been talking about. It's not. And I, actually, you know what? Uh, it's decisively broken, the 20-day moving average. Yesterday, it looked like maybe you want to still give it one more day. Yeah. But I think today, the way it uh, just effortlessly uh, broke that, uh, and uh, uh, the two rallies were sold into, anecdotally, what happens is the break of 20-day moving average leads to a sharp fall. And I think I have the numbers to back it. Uh, but before that, the bank nifty just about managed to close right at the 20-day moving average. In fact, the Bank Nifty's close was prevailing 20-day moving average. So, I think that is still, you want to still give benefit of doubt to the Bank Nifty because it's the leadership index. But let's look at the last few instances of the 20-day moving average breakdowns. And most of this, uh, I'm looking at this year only. Starting with January, on January 21, uh, the Nifty broke the 20-day moving average. And after that, it had a 7.8% decline over a two-month period. After that, uh, we reclaimed that. And then in April, we had, on April 18th, Another 20-day moving average breach. And guess what? This time also, the market fell 7.8%. The nifty that is. Uh, though this time, the fall was uh, a bit shorter in duration. Come June 13th, uh, the nifty again broke the 20-day moving average. And this time, the fall was 6.8%. Again, this time, the fall actually lasted for slightly longer duration. And this is what would give hope to the bulls that the next breach of 20-day <coughs> moving average was a temporary one on August 29th when it breached it and fell only about 3% and bounced back immediately after that. Uh, uh, so, December 15th, we broke the 20-day moving average. We don't know where it's going from here, right? Uh, but if you look at the broader market, uh, there are some signs that, uh, you know, most of the market indices are actually at or below the 20-day moving average. The mid-cap index is right at the 20-day moving average. Metals index is at 20-day moving average. FMCG index is very close to breaking it, just half a percent above that. Indices which have already broken that, pharma, uh, Auto index, no prices for guessing, IT index, 3.5% below uh, the 20-day moving average. The two indices which have managed to do well, capital goods, which till yesterday actually was almost at lifetime high, is still 2% above its 20-day moving average. And again, no surprises for guessing, the strongest index, the PSU bank index, which is 5% above its 20-day moving average. So, these are a few indices. Uh, in terms of stocks, uh, again, no surprises, HCL Tech, Infosys, uh, the ones which are the weakest, below the 20-day moving average. Kotak as well, down about 4%. Stocks with strength, you have ONGC, Indescent Bank, and Lassen and Tubro. Lassen, remember, even yesterday's trade made a lifetime high. Now, the stocks that I'm watching out for, which are at a make or break zone, right at the 20-day moving average. The close today was at the 20-day moving average. Uh, what are these stocks? You have SBI, you have HDFC Bank, both of these stocks right at the 20-day moving average. You have Reliance, ITC, and ICICI Bank. The three stocks which have led the market rally, they're now 2% below the 20-day moving average. If these stocks correct a bit more, then I think you are in for a sharper correction. That's what the anecdotal data tells us. Let's see if this time it's different or not. Uh, but what are you tracking, Reema? Well, I'm today talking about the correlation between the nifty valuations and what in the past have been the kind of returns that we've seen when the valuations are at current levels. So currently, the nifty is trading at valuations of 19 and a half to 20 times. So over the last two decades, when the nifty has been hovering around these valuations, 
what have been the ex expected one-year returns that we've seen. And we often hear from investors that Indian valuations are very expensive, much higher than what emerging markets are trading at, and that makes them a little cautious in India. But what exactly are excessive valuations according to India's standards, historical standards? At what point uh, does the risk reward turn extremely unfavorable? Right? That's what my piece is about. So let me start with the current valuation picture, right? Currently, as I said, we are at 19 and a half, 20 times higher than the long period average, but we are not at the highest peak valuations. The peak valuations in the Indian markets from an Indian market context has been close to about 25 to 25 and a half times. So here I'm breaking up, uh, you know, the valuation versus the return argument into two buckets. One, valuations at expensive levels, frothy levels, and that I'm constituting at a, between 22 times to 25 times. Now, in the last two decades, there have been four instances when the Nifty has traded closer to that 23, 24, 25 times kind of valuations. And you would see in three of them, in three of these instances out of four, the Nifty has given you a negative return. The worst has been, you know, around the Lehman crisis when the Nifty fell close to about 50% in the next one year. These are the annual returns that we've seen when the Nifty has traded at these. Your best case has been only a 1% average forward return on an annual basis. So the point is, from an Indian market historical context, frothy valuations perhaps are closer to 23, 24 times, 25 times, and that's when the risk reward has turned hugely unfavorable. Let's talk about India's current valuations, closer to 20 times. What has happened when we've hit these valuations in the past two decades. Well, as you can see, there are multiple instances when the valuations for a long period of time have been around that 22, uh, 20 to 22 times forward multiple. More often than not, you've got positive returns. But the extent of positive returns has been fairly moderate. Your best case has been low teens kind of returns and on an average you would have got you know a mid single digit kind of return so the bottom line is that perhaps as we set to enter 2023 we are trading at valuations which are higher than a long period average not excessive by historical standards but maybe 2023 may not turn out to be a you know a year where you get super normal you know returns it could be a year where you get moderate returns and that's what history tells us which then brings us to the next point that we're going to be talking about on editors roundtable if 2023 indeed has moderate returns is it time to look outside of the equity markets perhaps a debt and prashant you've got some interesting analysis there you know we uh, told our viewers about the problem which is high valuations 20 day moving average etc let's tell them the solution also uh, and the solution perhaps is fixed income this is according to s narain cio of icic approved listen and it's a 30 second bite and then we'll come back and present some data if you look at the last month, what we saw was that debt index fund right. have received huge inflows. And right. that's something which possibly as a product didn't exist two years back. So I think clearly we are seeing a situation that people will consider debt and SIP right. both. Right. And that will be the change which we will see in 2023. I think the big call will be that inflation will become much smaller as an issue okay. in 2023. Okay. And therefore, we are in a situation where multi-assets become very interesting that you consider all the asset classes. You know, they say, uh, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, right? And uh, the way to prepare for perhaps things not going as well as they have in 21 is uh, fixed income. That's a solution you heard from S. Narain, CIO of ICICI Pro. Now, our audience is very attuned to, uh, I mean, investing in equities because yeah, we've, be, we've lived through this TINA kind of uh, environment, right? There is no alternative except equities. But I think now you're getting to a point where fixed income instruments are getting to be attractive. They're vying for attention and they're competing for flows as well. Let me just quickly tell you, uh, you know, how interest rates have moved across a variety of uh, fixed income instruments, starting from call rate to repo to three month, six month, one year commercial paper. You're basically now getting anything between 6% to 8%, 6 to 8%. And if I compare where these rates were on the 31st of March, 2022, you know, they're up anything on an average between 250 to 300 basis points. And this is just, I mean, F5 till date. So we've seen a pretty large jump. The graphics are on your screen. So, so I mean, where do you invest, right? I mean, you want to invest in um, uh, debt fixed income instruments. There are, you know, we all know the public provident uh, fund. We know post office savings. We know tax-free bonds, uh, fixed maturity plans. But there are debt mutual funds as well 
which uh, Nareen was essentially saying is perhaps the best way to go. And I'll get to why he thinks it's the best way to go. But before that, within debt mutual funds, I mean, I'm not going to go into all of them, but just focus on debt mutual funds. Uh, just the kind of debt mutual funds there are and the options which are available to you. So, you know, the first is the overnight fund, overnight fund or the liquid fund. I mean, this is a product which largely, uh, you know, you can, you can say it's like the savings bank account. You have excess money, you park it there, you take it out when you need it. I mean, the investment duration usually is between one and seven days. Uh, it invests, invests in overnight securities. By the way, Narit made a point that liquid funds are now giving you 6.25 to 6.5% returns. Uh, and this is largely practically risk-free. So that's one. You want to in, uh, sort of increase the time horizon a little bit. Uh, there are money market funds. And money market funds, by definition, I mean, RBI rules don't permit them to invest in assets with maturities more than 12 months. Uh, they invest in things like commercial paper, certificates of deposits, treasury bills, etc. And here, I mean, I looked at what uh, funds are yielding. Uh, uh, the average is about 6.75%. Slightly longer duration uh, funds. I mean, these are uh, what you describe as up to one year kind of uh, schemes. They're called, they fall in the bucket of low duration funds. They invest in all kinds of things. I mean, bank CDs, CPs, T-bills, GSEX, state government loans, etc., etc. Returns here are largely aligned to the one-year certificate of deposit, which is between 75 to 7.6% or so. So, you know, now you're getting to 75 and more kind of levels. And then uh, you have the one to three-year kind of category, uh, which also yields about 7.5% in terms of returns. As I said, you can go longer, but over three, there are, you know, there is a three to five year bucket, over five year bucket. But the point is, at this point, you know, you don't know how the rate trajectory will really pan out. So there is always the option to invest in, say, for example, a one year fund uh, or a three year fund and then sort of reinvest it. I mean, for longer, if you think that uh, it's, it's yielding uh, similar or better returns. Taxation, uh, just, just a quick point on how taxation for debt mutual funds work. Uh, taxation only on capital gains and after if you hold it for three years uh, you you charge 20 percent but with indexation benefits uh, uh, there is higher liquidity as compared to investing directly in bonds these are highly I mean many of them are very very liquid instruments and of course there is also uh, the investment horizon which is extremely flexible because I mean there's liquidity available when you want it on call you can sell these units and uh, redeem them uh, as you want so some amount of capital protection as we head into 2023 I mean, I think uh, that's, the, uh, that's something to uh, keep on your radar, explore a little bit more, talk to your investment advisor, and perhaps take some exposure as well. Back to the Lal Street, back to equities, where deals still remain very, very hot, Nigel. Well, well, that's right. We're drawing to the close of the year, but Deal Street is up and buzzing. You, know, you can't take your eye off that. And this week itself, we had three big deals that were announced. So first off, from the cement space, that's Dalmia Bharat. Well, they went ahead and they announced a deal. The other one is the Pharma deal. That's between JB Chemicals as well as uh, Glenmark Pharma. And the third part is uh, TPG going ahead and picking up a subsidy, the housing finance subsidy of Poonawala Finance. So let's start off with the Dalmia uh, Bharat uh, deal first. They went ahead, they got closer on 10 million tons from JP Associates and uh, JP Power put it together. Now, the JP Associates assets, well, it's integrated. So it's a good deal for them. 5,600 crores they're paying. They're getting close to around 10 million tons. So that would mean an EV per ton of around $75 uh, per ton, which is very attractive. And keep in mind, they get an entry into central India with more than 10% share. So they become a pan-India player, and they're close to doubling their capacity now in the next few years. From 37 million tons, they've been talking about 75 million tons. That puts them on course. The problem is there's an arbitration with the Altatech Cement for one of the clinker units, that's 2.5 million tons. Part of those assets are in a JV with sale. Sale has 24%, so will sale bargain hard. And the third part is, what about the additional capex they have to spend? What about the limestone and the land? So that's about the Almey Abad. The sheet was a little bit, first took it positively, then some bit of a pullback because of the negatives. Next up, the clearest deal. That's JP, uh, J, uh, uh, you know, JB Chemicals as well as Glenmark Pharma. They picked up the Russell portfolio for around 315 crores. Remember, it's been in sales of around 60 crores. So that deal is stuck at around five times uh, you know, sales which is pretty good. It gives them the entry into the growing uh, statin market and also makes it more popular among cardiologists. So that's why that were the positives uh, that were viewed out there. The management spoke to us on CNBC TV and they said that their acquired portfolio gives margins of around 55%, which is good news. And in the next few years, from 60 crores, they look to take it to around 100 crores. Most of this will be funded by a debt. And finally, Poonawala FinCorp, well, they have sold their housing finance arm to TPG. That will be done for around 3,900 uh, you know, uh, crores or thereabouts, which means the you know, price to book value of closure on three and a half times. Initially, the street said, well, it's a good deal. 
The problem is what's left. You're selling the secured part of your book, and the unsecured part of your book is there. You have a lab book as well as some pre-owned vehicle finance. So a little bit skittish on the under, uh, you know, developed uh, pending book. So that's why the street was a little bit skittish. But otherwise, we had Adar Poonawala who joined in. And he said that they're looking at improving ROE, ROA from year on. They're looking at growing the book by around 35 to around 40% uh, or uh, thereabouts. And they're saying they don't require any more capital. So big deals announced this week. Uh, uh, next week, I'm... Uh, heard most of them on DRM. Uh, on DRM. So we heard... We are plugging that in. We are plugging <laughs> that, <laughs> plugging <laughs> that <laughs> in. Of course, uh, congrats to you, Nimesh, on that. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, the, the point Prashant made about 7%, 7.5%. And, you know, I know a lot of people would scoff at that. Uh, Actually, this year, you know, Nifty has done 3.65%. We, yeah. we, we, get, we get a lot, you know, swayed by the recency bias of the last two or three months. Technically, this year, the market has not given you anything unless you were in the right stocks. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you bought a Nifty basket, even this year, you would not be beating the fixed yeah. income by a lot. So, yeah. uh, this 7%, uh, 8% risk-free is not something to scoff at. In fact, Neil Mishra was making this point that, you know, we've already had a lot of PE expansion. That's the only reason we've had a rally, not yeah. because of earnings expansion. So, I think I, I take your point. I mean, I, I myself am looking at, you know, putting some money yeah. in, in fixed income. And Narendra was saying that it's already happening for the last it's two months. Yeah. Non-SIP yeah. flows, exactly. a lot of it, because we're seeing this discretionary amount shrink to next to nothing. Yeah. A lot of that is going into a debt. And last month, apparently, Absolutely. was uh, very you know, large. You know, and just just uh, personally as well, there are some instruments which uh, a normal working class person as well should put. One is that VPF, the two and a half lakhs that you get out there. Yeah. The PPF as well as if you have a daughter, then the yeah. Sukanya Samriti, Sukanya. one yeah. and a half. So five and a half to six lakhs, you're clearly getting an average of seven and a half percent or easy peasy. Next eight years, that money no. doubles. And Nigel said normal people, right? Not Nigel, right? Me. <laughs> I'm doing it. If you have, if you have, if you have, if you have two daughters, you you're lucky. Double, <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll take a break now. Up next, of course, we'll be joined by Rahul Arora, CEO of Nimal Bank Institutional Equities. Uh, to give his view on, on the last state and, of course, uh, a lot of individual stocks. All right, welcome back. You're with us here on Editor's Roundtable. Now, the question uh, we're asking is, is the Nifty PSE index, that's a public sector enterprises index, on the verge of a multi-decadal breakout? Nimesh has walked across to the big wall uh, and he's got some interesting data. Nimesh, over to you. Thanks, Vishal. So, you know, as you, uh, so we all know that the PSU bank index has been a big rally this year, but my focus today is on the non-banking PSUs. Yes, I'm talking about the Nifty PSE index, which is the private sector enterprises index. Now, why I'm saying it could be on the verge of a technical breakout? The reason is very simple. If you look at the chart, currently we are around 4,400 to 4,500 levels. Uh, we're just 4 to 5% away from breaking the all-time highs. The all-time high on this index was 4,687. Uh, As I said, you know, 4 to 5% away. The recent high was 40, 4,430. We are pretty much around those levels. Now, uh, if you look at the chart, you know, uh, in, the, in these last, so last, uh, the all-time high was way back in 2008. We've not seen that levels uh, since 2008. And four to five times we've attempted to cross that level and we've failed. So this is the reason why I'm saying if, the, if this breaks out, it could be a multi-decade breakout for the Nifty PSE index. Now, even if you look at the fundamentals, like I've compared for, with 2017 and 2022. In 2017, uh, the price to earnings was 15.3. Currently, it's just at eight times. So... In, the, in that context, it's, it's looking good. If you look at the price to book, in 2017, the price to book was close to 1.4. Today, it's just 1.1. So even, even that is looking good. If you look at the dividend yield, in, two, in 2017, the dividend yield of this basket was just 3.5%. Uh, Today, it's yielding 6% dividend yield. So even that has improved in the last five years. Now, which are the big gainers in this PSE basket for this year? This year, the biggest gainer was HAL, up 117%. Coal India is up 56%. BEL... BHL was a surprise move up 45%. NTPC, NHPC, the power companies are doing good 48%. And Concord is up 25%. The big losers, of course, it's going to be the metal names. So Nalco and Sale within the metal names, they are the big losers. LIC was down 18%. ISC is because of that overhang is down 16%. And the two uh, you know, oil companies, HPCL and VPCL, down 15% and 9% each. So these were the big losers. Now, uh, look at the high dividend yield of these companies. The biggest, high di high, highest dividend yield Within this basket is Coal India, 20%. Even I was surprised that Coal India gives 20% dividends. Uh, you know, Power Finance is up, uh, is, gives a dividend of 8.3%. ONGC is close to 8%. The likes of Oil India, Power Grid, around 6% and HPCL gives a dividend of 5.7%. Uh, now, which are the big stocks which can you know, break the index? Now, the biggest weight in this, in this basket is NTPC, uh, uh, cl close to 15% weight. Power Grid has a weight of 13.7%. ONGC is 9.8%. Uh, and coal India has got 8.5 percent. The focus of this is largely because in the in the last quarter we normally see you know big dividend payouts uh, because government wants money. So 
dividend pay payout is going to be a big trigger for, for, for these companies. But uh, technically, it looks like, given the kind of fundamentals we have, if there is a big breakout in that PSC Nifty index, you could say big move. And there are, there are now a lot of tailwinds which are supporting these companies. And hence, the, PSC, uh, the Nifty PSC index is something that investors should watch out for, at least for the next quarter. OK, Nimesh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on. Are we at the verge of a multi-decade, uh, multi-year, rather, breakout in the PSU stocks? Uh, Rahul Arora is joining us now, uh, as discussed. Uh, Rahul, hi, good evening. Uh, any of these stocks uh, that uh, you're buying right now in the in the PSU basket? So I think, Anuj, uh, from a valuation standpoint, uh, PSU banks, I think SBI and Bank of Baroda still have a play. Uh, I think uh, given the fact that, you know, you would have seen the numbers of SBI at the end of the last quarter, the ROA ROEs, as Nimesh was talking about, are at multi-year highs. And I think because the return ratios are improving, people are now ready to pay the kind of increasing price. And I think the other basket, because the Prime Minister is so positive on defense and he's trying to do everything he can, I think you're seeing a lot of rush on PSU defense. And that could be, uh, you know, another interesting aspect. That's so I think preferred play as well, but don't you think it's getting a bit crowded now? You, you, you think still room for... Well, for, Anuj, uh, see, typically what happens is, if I take you back to a Reliance or a Hindustan lever that had 10-year consolidations and then broke out and became 10 baggers. So I, I don't necessarily think that we're there yet in some of these uh, names. I think, you know... SBI, for example, I mean, you know, we've seen what's happened to HDFC as the last decade. You have SBI life insurance listed. At some stage, SBI mutual fund will list. So there are a lot of these guys, you know. So I think there is a, some of the part valuations also that will probably come into play. So I think, you know, sometimes it, it too fast, too soon. Uh, I think that's probably happened with the chemical sector also, you can say that. But I think these themes are slightly more long drawn out. And uh, because they're coming out of, you know, multi-year uh, breakouts, these possibly can sustain. I think not so much. I mean, there'll be a little bit of an earnings cash up, but can these stocks still compound from here? I think there is a, there is a definite yes. Well, Rahul, you know, this week there were quite a few deals that were announced, right? We had from the cement play, you had Pharma, and then you had the housing finance arm as well as Poonawala finance. Uh, you know, Street was a little bit confused on two of them. That's the Dalmia Bharat deal as well as the Poonawala Fincorp deal. For JB Chemicals, it was an outright positive, 10%, I think, in terms of revenue addition. What's your sense? Any of these g deals, you know, uh, were, are you positive on any of the stocks that, that were involved? So I think, you know, the issue with uh, the cement deal, of course, is that there is a public sector undertaking that's a very large shareholder there, and we don't know how that's going to pan out because they hold almost a 26% stake yeah. in that company. Uh, and then, of course, there are logistical challenges about that region and the kind of transport that you'll see on cement. So I, when I spoke to my cement analyst, she doesn't necessarily believe that it's a done deal yet. Yeah. Uh, I think this could probably evolve as, as time goes on. Uh, uh, on the other space, on housing finance, we do track Poonawala. I think uh, if he does want to focus on everything non-housing, I think this capital will help boost up uh, his overall tier one plus tier two ratio and will probably give him the growth capital that he needs. I think 20, 25% compounding with the kind of management pedigree that you have and the return ratios, I, I don't think it's too expensive. I think, you know, this yeah. is a company that's probably coming to you at about a 12, 13% ROE. There's so, a fintech acquisition also coming. That's what he told us. Yeah. So it's very possible. Like I said, I, I mean, you don't it's, necessarily have to be, uh, you know, yeah. president. I'll give you a classic case about gold finance, right? One of the reasons that the market used to always ascribe a premium to Muthut over Manapuram was because Manapuram went into LAP, it went into MSME, it went into vehicle financing. So sometimes people just like you to focus on one particular core because banking has, you know, people are trying to diversify too much too quickly. So I think from a growth capital standpoint, no harm done for Poonawala. Cement, I don't think it's a done deal yet. Uh, JV Chemicals has been our top pick in the mid-cap pharma space. I think it's a great acquisition and it's not the first. He's done yeah, a couple of others. Uh, so uh, a bit of a question mark on cement, buyer in JV. Uh, I think I'd be a buyer in Poonawala as well. What about 2023? Um, we are trading at you know valuations of close to about 20 times. In the past, in the last two decades, when we've traded at these valuations, the kind of returns that we've got have been fairly moderate, subpar, you would say. Are those the kind of returns we should expect in 2023 as well? So I think, uh, Reema, what's happening is alternate asset classes are emerging. Uh, you know, you could probably put your money into a 10-year GSEC today and get 7.5% without doing anything. Uh, fixed deposit rates for different people at different age groups are between 7 quarter to 8.5%, depending on which bank you pick up. So these are now emerging as very credible alternates uh, to equity markets. Uh, the uh, tough challenge, I think, is that the uh, economic impact of these rate increases uh, hasn't been felt yet. ACL Tech is probably the first company company that's actually called out something, I think this is going to get more pronounced. Uh, so I genuinely think that it's going to be a very, very challenging year. We may well land up closing next year at very similar levels at 18 and a half, 19,000.
10,000. But that may not be without probably retesting the lows that you saw at the start of the war. So I think there's a, there's a genuine case for the Nifty to revisit 15, 16,000. But you'll see very aggressive buying there. So I think for the year, the 2023, you'll probably, it's probably like going to land up being a very volatile year. Uh, but I think at best, you'll probably have flat headline returns. But that's not to say that you won't make money in stocks. I think it could be a great time when the market corrects. This could be the beginning of it. It may, may not be. I don't know. Yeah. But I think that the economic impact hasn't been felt. Earnings downgrades haven't even started yet. And they are going to happen with the cost of capital going up. So I think you need to just brace for some challenging times and not, not expect a linear run like you saw from 7.5 to 18.5,000 on the Nifty. Okay, quick question, France or Argentina? Well, Anush, as you know, we had spoken uh, on air as well before it started and, uh, you know, 50% has made it there. I was hoping for a France, France or Brazil, Brazil final. I think uh, just looking at the construct, the way France played their last match against Morocco and the kind of chances they gave Morocco, if they give those kind of chances to Argentina, I don't know. But just since I backed France from the start, I'd say 51-49 in favour of France. But uh, Is this your head or your heart talking? Uh, I think... You know, if you compare the two frontliners, I think Mbappe is a little quicker than Messi is right now. I think uh, those are, that's where the headline is going to be. I think the head is still staying 51-49 France, but if Messi has a Sachin Tendulkar moment where he goes out on a high with the World Cup on his hand... 51-49 is neither here nor there. It's like... Anush said about 5 one So, no, so I, I, I still think it's going to be a very high goal scoring, Graham. I think, you know, I, I think it's probably going to be 3-2 whichever way it goes. But, okay, I'll probably say 60-40 France. I'll probably up, up it because I've backed France from, from the very beginning and I'll be, it'll, be, it'll be great to see a defending champion come in, but it'll be see an equal, equally huge Guys, fairy tale of Messi. you bet with your heart, not just your head all the time. <laughs> see, <laughs> there have been so many underdogs in, this, in yeah. this tournament. I mean, at one point, the heart was even rooting for Croatia, to be very honest. But I, I just think that... You know, God has his plans. I mean, it, yeah. this is not the way Ronaldo would have wanted his campaign to end. So, you know, you never know. God has plans for all of us. You know, if I, it's, if just, it's meant just, to be Messi's moment, I'm just will. happy it's, a, it's on Sunday. It's, 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 it's not at midnight. Thank God. It's Thank God. It's at eight. That yeah. is so true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that great note, we're going to wrap up on another edition of Editor's Roundtable. Thank you for watching.